Now, in the past, conferences, <clears throat> I've often begun with a presentation. And this year, I'm doing it a little differently. And part of it is because I've grown a little bit. I had a friend recently, uh, a speaker, who, if I mentioned his name, you all would recognize. And he, we happened to be at a conference together, and he, he said, Mark, uh, are you mad at me? I said, no. What do you mean? He says, well, you have this great conference, but you haven't invited me to speak at it yet. <laughs> and I had to very creatively tell him that it has nothing to do with whether I like him or not, or whether we're in, in, in good, you know, and it, it has to do with the fact that our Deep in History conferences are kind of unique. And I admitted to him that if I wasn't the president of the Coming Home Network, I wouldn't be invited to speak either. Because <laughs> I am certainly not an expert on history or especially the English Reformation. I've read a lot about it. In fact, as I've been thinking through my presentation tonight, I've most of the time had to kind of hold back my opinions because I've got some really strong opinions about the English Reformation that sometimes wouldn't be very charitable because of what I've read or what I've seen as an effect of the English Reformation. And the reason I'm cautious is because I know that I'm not a, a well-trained historian and in fact it may be true that every single one of us here suffers from a common ailment and that we well, let me ask you this. How many of you here would raise your hand and believe that you have all the data there is on the English Reformation? Could I see a hand? Well, there's a couple of experts here in the front row. Because very often, isn't it true that when we look back in history, that as we understand an event, we are limited to the data that we have received through our formation? Whether we were taught in public school or private school or Catholic school or Protestant school, what books we read, what teachers we sat under, and what their perspective was, and maybe their slant, their spin, have all influenced us. And I'm, for that reason, ex very excited for this weekend. And I believe that we have invited a, a, a wonderful group of speakers dealing with different aspects of this event happened about 500 years ago. Now, <clears throat> why are we doing these Deep in History conferences? I thought the first thing that I would do tonight is just take some time to tell you, why are we doing these? And there's five reasons that I can think of. The first has to do, and I have to admit, it's personal. You don't need to take notes on these, because there won't be a test later on these five things. <laughs> and they won't make a difference of your justification either, whether you have them, but <laughs> I have to admit personally that in my own spiritual journey, the discovery of history was one of those things that turned me home to the Catholic Church. I was brought up Lutheran, and I, I'm giving you my, a little bit of my history, not just to recount it like I've done many times, but because we connect. Some of us have the same experience. I was brought up Lutheran through all the hoops of Lutheranism, and had a truncated understanding of church history that coincided with how I learned it as a young Lutheran. And I didn't learn very much about church history. I knew about Martin Luther. I knew about biblical history. And that was it. I didn't know the name of a Christian between the time of the apostles and Martin Luther. I may have thought of St. Francis or someone like that, possibly Augustine, but I didn't know who they were. But basically, that was my understanding of history. And to a certain extent, that was my understanding of history for the first 20 years of my life. I had picked up a variety of things in elementary school and high school. But you realize, in many ways, the history that we in America learn about the English Reformation is to a certain extent a created history, an official history. 
established under Elizabeth I that became the official history of Oxford and Cambridge that you had to teach and believe if you wanted to survive in England. And that understanding of the Reformation is what most of us here in America have inherited. We were colonies. It's a part of our history. I ended up having an, a, a life-changing adult conversion in my early 20s and from let's say age 21 until I was 26 when I entered seminary, a day didn't go by when I didn't study scripture. On fire for the Bible. I'm reading the Bible every day, reading commentaries every day about the Bible. But the thought never crossed my mind to pick up a book on history, the history of the church. Why? Because the Bible was sufficient. The Bible was all I needed. To be a better Christian, I needed to study the Bible. I went away to seminary and had my eyes opened. We had history classes in seminary. I went to a great seminary, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. It was an evangelical school, it was a little more open to history. We studied church history, but even my, the, what I received in seminary about church history was truncated. I learned now more Christians during those 1,500 years that existed before the Reformation. But often it was with a slant, a spin. They were good Christians. It's too bad for their Catholicism. <laughs> often we looked at the history of the church in relation to the missionary movements, the great missionaries that went, Columba and, and St. Patrick and others, and we studied them almost as individual missionaries. They happened to be sent by the Pope in Rome, but that was... You know, that was a hindrance rather than a positive effect. We looked at all these churches as independent churches trying to break away, but they didn't realize their need for breaking away until, this may have been my truncated way of understanding it, until all of a sudden because of the Renaissance, we became smart <laughs> and courageous and broke free. We broke free first on the continent, and then we broke free in England. And the way I kind of looked at Henry VIII and that whole cadre of folk was that, you know, I mean, how do you start a religion because you wanted a divorce? But the point was, to me, that was a sign of the decadence of the church and the need for further breaking away. And what's the great, what is the great sign of the freedom from all of that religious oppression in Europe? We celebrate it in a couple weeks. Thanksgiving. The pilgrims. They landed here free from religious oppression. It was to be a new Jerusalem on a hill. Free. Well, those of you who know your, uh, New England history, how free was the religion in New England? <laughs> in some ways, it was worse than Europe. But I was being ordained a Congregationalist, and I loved New England. <laughs> Congregationalism. The freedom, the independence, the autonomy. Free to covenant together, to follow Jesus without any of these oppressive, hierarchical corruption twisting our true following of Jesus. I was ordained a Congregationalist for about a year. <laughs> quickly became a Presbyterian. Because <laughs> I realized that institutionalized autonomy was a mess. When I recognized that every individual in, independent group could decide on whatever creed they wanted. And the point was, there was no connection to any historical faith. Because every individual church could decide for itself what it needed to believe. Often they believe Trinitarian views, but there are lots of Congregationalists that are Unitarians. There's a disconnect from history. But I never put my finger on what the problem was. I became a Presbyterian, because at least in Presbyterian there were creeds. There was a book of confessions. There was a connection with history. You were connected with the faith of thousands and thousands back to Jesus. I served as a Presbyterian pastor for nine years. The confusion was what drove me from the pastorate. Confusion in the sense that the Bible alone wasn't enough. Because the Bible, out of its context, 
can be interpreted in hundreds of different ways. I'm not going to give my whole story tonight. I told that at the first conference. But my decision to become Catholic was a gift because friends of mine who I'd known in seminary, good Scott Hahn, got one of them here, Jerry Manatix is here visiting us, shared the faith with me. There were lots of reasons why I turned to the church. But one of them that I didn't expect was the power of history. To discover the importance of history. It was the, the witness of these converts and then good faithful Catholics like Carl Keating and others to help me discover things that I had missed. The early church fathers, the writings of the saints, the lives of the saints, the councils and the creeds. And then I read a book by Newman, and in the introduction of that book, there was this statement, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. And a light went off, because that described my journey. That it isn't history that saves, but it's history in understanding our faith that helps us make sure that what we are believing is true. Because it's in history that we discover the church, the authority of the church, the liturgy, our doctrines. So much of our faith is historical. Why is our faith historical? Because there was a day when a historical man died on a cross. There was a day when that historical man rose for our sins. We have a historical faith. And tradition didn't necessarily end with the last day the apostles died. Because tradition continues. It's the history of the church. And so in my own journey, I realized how important history was. And now, being a Catholic for 13 years, and I love history, it's just made me more convicted of my Catholic faith. The first time I gave my journey story to an audience was at a Defending the Faith conference about 13 years ago. And I ended that talk with the statement that Newman says, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. In other words, when you study history, you discover that many of the pillars, the most important things that Protestants build their faith on, don't hold the weight of faith. Sola Scriptura, sola fide. But I also twisted that statement around. You see, to cease to be deep in history is to become Protestant. Catholics, if you forget, if you don't know your history, if you don't study and understand the battles that the church has fought, then you will forget why. Do you realize that every Sunday in Mass when we say the creed, you know all those little phrases we say, God from God, true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. I mean, some might say, what, what a bunch of collected bunch of words. But you realize historically every phrase is there for a purpose. Because it was fighting against an alternative, inaccurate, heretical view of Christ. And so that's why every word is significant. And you learn that in history. So part of the reason for these conferences is I realize deep in my heart the importance of knowing our historic faith. A second reason was, in this work in the Coming Home Network, we became, began to encounter other converts, and it seemed like every single one of them had the same message, that history was a big reason they came home to the church, especially the discovery of the early church fathers, and again, the writings of the saints and the writings of the church leaders and the councils and the creeds. And, and also learning that we had some bad popes and a few bad bishops. We're all sinners. It didn't turn us away. It doesn't mean the church is less holy. It led, there's always need for renewal. And as we began realizing we had this common, this common message, especially the guests on my Journey Home program. Have you seen the Journey Home program? I'm just curious. Have any of you? Oh, I, you don't have to clap, I'm just wondering a, a marketing survey, you know. 
But if you've listened to the program, you realize week after week how many of the guests, part of their journey was a rereading of history, filling in the gaps, um, correcting misunderstandings, having a few mea culpas because of things that we said that we believe were true that were dead wrong. A third reason for the Deep in History Conference is I'm, about nine, ten years ago, my staff and I were talking, and it came across our thinking that within our lifetime, we would be celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I had not heard anybody talk about that. I would mentioned it to a few, and they, they said, oh, that's right. And I realized that on the, on the day, October 31st, 2017, That'll be the 500th anniversary of the 95 Theses. And there'll probably be lots of conferences and books and TV interviews celebrating the Great Reformation. And our thought was, what are we going to do <laughs> to get ready for that? And the idea of a conference. We also began printing books. One of them was The Roots of the Reformation by Carl Adam, a wonderful book, a fine, short history of the Reformation primarily the Continental Reformation. A, f a fourth reason, besides seeing this pending need for combating the misinformation out there, <clears throat> was <laughs> I travel every week, right? And four planes a week, minimum. And I'm often asked by people, hey, what do you do for a living? <laughs> and, oh, I'm the president of the Coming Home Network International. <laughs> oh, really? Do you, do you help orphans come home? Or do they... <laughs> well, actually what we do is we, we help Protestant ministers uh, lose their jobs, <laughs> give up their ministry, become bankrupt, and become Catholic. And the discussion stops real fast. <laughs> and I, was, I thought that I need a, a better discussion starter on the airplanes <laughs> other than something that says the coming home network. It just gets me into trouble every time. And it, as I was thinking about that, the idea for our, our symbol came to mind. The idea of having a a coffee cup or a bookmark or a hat or something that had the picture, a collage of historic figures with the phrase deep in history, deep in scripture, deep in Christ, would be a wonderful discussion starter. Somebody would look over and say, deep in history, deep, deep in scripture, deep in Christ. That's interesting. What's that all about? And then it could be a discussion about scripture or about history, about Christ, an evangelistic outreach. I could get them around to the Coming Home Network, but the, the point was, it again reminded me of the, the need for people to discover the true history of our faith. A fifth reason that led to this conference was the reading of a book, in fact, by one of our speakers tonight. I read a wonderful book by Joseph Pierce called Literary Converts. Is Joseph sitting here? Is he? I wonder if Joseph is here. I want him to know that I... I love that book. Have you read that book, Literary Converts? I was in England looking through a, just a regular old bookstore, and I, I didn't, I've never heard of Joseph, and I saw this book sitting in a bookshelf. It hadn't gotten to America yet. I picked it up. I had no idea where the author was coming from. I didn't know if it would be a good book, but it looked interesting. I read this book. This book traces all the great convert writers of England and America, for the last 150 years. It's a tremendous book. And as I read the book, what it made me realize is these are great men and women of faith that are forgotten. They had great influence in their writings, but to a majority of people, they are now forgotten. And the idea for a conference to bring them back was another impetus behind our conference. So we began the conferences We've done four. This is our fourth. The first one, and this is a bit of an infomercial. If you weren't at the conferences, we got a great batch of tapes out there. <laughs> because the, the talks 
Those of you that have been here, I hope you affirm that the talks of the last four years have been superb. They have been excellent on all aspects of the faith. The first year, we had a variety of speakers. Joseph Pierce and was there talking on literary converts. A number of our board members, uh, Father Ryland and Paul Thigpen and Kenneth Howell and a variety of speakers, I can't remember all of them. On history in general, the importance of history is kind of our first step into it. The second year, we went to the, what we considered the most common need for most moderns, and that is to discover the early church fathers, the beauty of the early church fathers, and how Catholic they were. Then last year, we took our first step into the Reformation. We did the Continental Reformation in Germany. Began with what were the roots, what caused the Reformation. Then we looked at the different reformers and the Catholic response. It's a good set of tapes. And now this year, we jumped the pond and we're in England. The English Reformation. Now, I mentioned a little earlier that all these talks are important. And I want you to hear the flow so you understand where we're going. When I'm done gabbing, Dwight Longnecker will speak. Now, Dwight is a convert to the church. He was originally an American. Pastor, student, went to England, went to Oxford, studied, became an Anglican minister. I think he was on the Isle of Wight. Wasn't that the Isle of Wight? I'll get a little bit, I'll get, have the official introduction. He came into the church and has this great perspective, kind of an English Anglican, American English slant to things. He is going to give an overall history. What was the church like in England from the Romans all the way up to the Reformation? What was the church like? And was it in need of renewal? Then we'll have Monsignor Frank Lane. How many of you heard from Monsignor Lane before? He's a local local priest, great preacher, great speaker, a great gift every year. We're always glad he comes. He is going to look directly at the schism. Henry, the influences from Henry VIII to Elizabeth I. All right, what happened? That'll be tonight. And then we'll have a social. Kick back, relax. Tomorrow. Now, Jamie Bogle isn't going to be here. I, should, I don't know if I should have Joanna tell you the details, but he couldn't come because he's in Rome attending the wedding of one of the royal family who is Catholic. A very interesting, I'll have Joanna talk more about that. A very important event. So Joanna has his notes, knows the subject well. She's going to begin us in the morning on the attempted return, Mary Tudor. There's another name for her, but I'm not going to mention it, all right? Again, depending on what history you learned. We're going to hear about the attempt and the response to what Henry did tomorrow from Joanna. Then Joseph is going to deal with, I'm not sure if it's pronounced recusants or recusants. Either way, recusants, okay. In other words, there were, in, there were Catholics all through the Reformation that had to hide for protection, for survival, to keep from losing their property. And we're going to hear about these secret lives and those that did all kinds of things to defend the Catholic faith. And then after lunch, Paul Thigpen are going to talk about those who lost their faith, the martyrs. And it's a sad story when we see how these good men and women of faith were massacred. And we'll see that tomorrow under Paul. Scott Hahn will be here in the afternoon to deal with defenders of the faith. Two shining lights in the midst of this otherwise difficult time. Thomas More and Thomas Fisher. John, John Fisher. John Fisher, sorry. Then in the evening after dinner, Father Charles Connor, who you also recognize from EWTN, is going to look at the English Counter-Reformation. How the church responded to the problems, but also to the attacks. And then Jane, uh, Joanna Bogle will return to finish the evening with 
the aftermath. What has happened since the Reformation to today? How has it affected our lives, the church, the church in England? And then on Sunday morning, Father Ray Ryland, who himself is an Anglican clergy convert, who's now a priest, will talk about his own looking back at the Church of England, the church that he left when he became Catholic. And then we'll have a panel discussion to deal with all your questions. That's the flow. You see the importance of, of being there for everything. Now, I'd like to set your thinking, though, for the weekend. As you listen to the speakers. And I'm going to borrow something from the talk I gave last year because there's a very interesting psalm that it's just amazing how this psalm fits the topic. Psalm 11:3. And it goes like this. When the if, excuse me, if the foundations are destroyed, what are the faithful to do? If the foundations are destroyed, what are the faithful to do? It's a fascinating question. And in a sense, that, that little psalm addresses the Reformation as well as it addresses today. There's four th questions. Number one, what are the foundations, the essentials? Number two, are they destroyed or just in bad shape, in need of renewal? Number three, who are the righteous? Who are the right? Who are the ones that have a responsibility to do something about it? And then fourthly, what ought they to do? And as we look back, we ask the question, what did they do? And what did what they uh, activate, institute, was it right? In relationship to their analysis as to whether the foundations were destroyed. I'm going to give the same 10 points that I gave last year quickly. I gave a list of 10 foundation stones that there's a long list of other things, but these are 10 things that I believe we would all agree that a Christian, let's say in the the year 1000 in England, the year 1200 in England, the year 1300 in England, up to the Reformation, all of them would agree that these 10 foundation stones should be expected of the church. They assume that this was true. There may be more, there may be a few of these that you might differ with me on, but think about these 10 things. The first five are structural, dealing with our faith. The rest of them have more to deal with the internal evidence of the faith. The first thing that all Christians of Christendom, almost all, I should say it that way, would presume is that Jesus intended there to be how many churches? One. one. There was one church. There were, of course, of course, there had been schisms. There had been some breaking away. But the understanding was different than what we have today because we live in a, in a soup of most people believing that there's a bazillion churches, if there was ever intended to be a church at all. But then the unanimous decision was that there was intended to be one church. Number two, the authority of Peter. There were times when there was confusion. There were times when that Peter wasn't, that Pope wasn't in Rome, he was in Avignon. There was a time when there were two candidates arguing where they were popes. There was a time when there were three candidates. But there was an understanding that the pope was the head of the church established by Christ. That was a given. There were certainly kings that battled against the pope, and, but that was a given. Number three, underneath that authority, there were bishops. The apostolic succession of those men who carried on the mission of Christ and the apostles. That was understood, the authority of the bishops under Peter. And fourthly, underneath those bishops were priests that carried the responsibility and the work of the bishops and the pope in the one church. 
Would you agree at least at this point that those were probably foundation stones amongst Christendom? They would all agreed with that. Number five is that there was a set of doctrines, creeds, that were to be believed that had been established by this hierarchy at councils under the leadership of the magisterium in union with the Bishop of Rome. Now again, there were maybe a few dissenting voices, but the majority would have agreed to those as foundation stones. The second set of five now deal with the condition of those people in a hierarchy. Number six, there was an assumption that those in the position, whether it was pope, bishop, or priest, were to be servants. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the church taught. They were to model service, servanthood. They weren't to lord it over. They weren't to have ambition. They weren't to seek control and power and position. Everybody knew that's not what Jesus taught. He taught servanthood, number six. Number seven, Jesus also taught that these leaders, as well as everyone in the church, was called to be holy. Perfect as your heavenly Father was perfect. Holiness, seeking to model Christ. That was understood. There may not have been good catechesis. There may not have been very good priestly formation. But it was an understood expectation of holiness. Number eight, to fine tune that holiness, there was an expectation of these three things. Have you heard of these before? Poverty, chastity, and obedience. At different levels, whether you were religious or priest, bishop or pope, but all were expected to live by those three things. Poverty. The goal of being a bishop or a pope or a priest was not to be money. It was not to be greedy. It was not to have women on the side. Children on the side and families. It was an understood thing. Chastity and obedience. This structure recognized the obedience that Christ had established in his apostolate, that they were to carry that. A ninth understanding, foundation, would have been, from want of a better word, internal conversion. In other words, that the Christian life was not merely externals, but that it involved of conversion of heart. Scripture taught that. Jesus taught that. That it was to be on the inside as well as the outside. That was to be an understanding. One last thing as a foundation stone doesn't quite fit with the rest, but there was a belief in blessings and curses. In other words, if we lead a good life, somehow God will shine. And if things aren't going so well, we must have done something wrong. There wasn't necessarily a direct connect like you see in the Old Testament. But for example, when the, when, the, uh, when the plague hit Europe and half the population died, one of the questions was, what did we do wrong? There's something going wrong in this church. And when blessings came, they looked for reasons. There was a direct connect. Now, if, if we just at least assume those foundation stones, my question is, what were their conditions? in the years leading up to the English Reformation. How did the people of England, the hierarchy of England, the royalty of England, understand one church, one pope, the authority of bishops, the ministry of priests? So far, we're doing pretty well in England. Dwight will talk about that. I don't think really there were any question in England before the Reformation on one church, one pope, the authority of bishops, and the ministry of priests. It's when you start getting down the list, though. Doctrine was probably fine, too, though. There were some challenges on certain issues. But when we get to the issue of holiness, chastity, poverty, obedience, we start seeing problems.
we start seeing problems. One of the reasons I didn't want to get in details about myself and leave it to the other speakers about English Reformation is I have a bit more sympathy for the Continental Reformation than I do the English Reformation. You know, there were some things that Luther attacked that needed attacking. Many of the things Luther was attacking, the church recognized, needed renewal. We know that. In England, it was a bit of a different story. Now, our reason for this conference is not so that we can, with haughtily spirit, look back and consider ourselves more holy than those folk back then. Right? right? I mean, it, it isn't here just to point fingers. That old preacher when I was a kid that said, when you point a finger, you got three pointing back at yourself. <laughs> what can we learn for ourselves when we study the English Reformation? What can we learn about our faith? What can we learn about the condition of faith in the world from studying the English Reformation? What can we learn when we look around us at the church and we come to the conclusion that the foundations aren't doing very well, and we decide we're going to do something about it, the question is, what do we do? Because people have decided that in the past and sometimes made some awful mistakes. What can we do, what can we learn from our study of the Reformation to make sure that the church we leave our children is in better shape then we found it. I'm not challenging the holiness of the church, but you know why I know for at least a fact that the church is a bit sinful? Because I'm here, you know? Right? And we in our life have a responsibility. We can't say it's the job of, of Pope Benedict, God bless him, we have a great pope, and our great bishops, we had our bishop here tonight, Bishop Campbell, is a holy man. We can't say it's their job or the priest's job because we got three, three fingers pointing back at each of us on how can you and I begin authentic renewal here. To me, that's the biggest message of our conference. It's how each of us can grow closer to our Lord in all those ten foundations. Holiness, chastity, poverty, obedience, Servanthood, loyalty to the church, to our Holy Father, to the bishops, to the priests, to our doctrines, so that together we are witnesses to our church.